So um, let's begin. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode. The title is "Could Be Matter." Could matter be language for intelligent space? And I would like to share my own uh, experiential opening to what I consider to be the guy in mind. <clears throat> or another way of saying seeing an animate dimension that can have meaning to the personality of the earth. I found it an interesting concept, guys, that we have as human beings um, reached a point of sophistication where we have developed languages and in some sense the adoption of a language requires the memorization or reception of an alphabet. So for me, I have had moments where I have used language as a person and there has been certain states of both speech and in writing, mainly in writing, where I have felt where it's as if the sequence, just like how you put in uh, different letters, kind of make up different words and then different words in a sentence with the space in between uh, paint a certain picture. For a second, I kind of saw as if what if matter was the alphabet for a higher dimensional being. Now there are these deep thoughts where some philosophers have kind of considered that, wait a minute, what if when I think of a thought, that thought has a life of its own, that thought is alive. <clears throat> so now in regards to how real or can language be, that's another discussion, but I just want to, gonna, I got a piece of paper here, I'm going to make a note of that. How real can language be, that's a question I, that's very crucial to answer here in this talk. Uh, how real can language be? Okay, I'm going to make a note of that. <clears throat> so the thing is, guys, I, we use right now, we use right now an alphabet uh, to conceive words. And then we use those words, and in a certain sequence, those words on a piece of paper with their kind of uh, 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 res uh, respective space in between the words, you can say a picture gets formed, a picture gets made. When we look at the human being, what is life? It's like this conscious waking state. You live in it. You do certain activities. But now during that conscious waking uh, state, not only is your heart beating, not only are you blinking, not only is your attention multi <clears throat> direct, mu directed in multiple ways, but it's that there is this on and off effect. And this is very crucial to study as a human being because it means that you're not in one way to judge yourself as one kind of person. You know, when we think of ourselves, uh, personality has opened us to, uh, to us as to the singular dimension pretty much. We, right now in today's world, <clears throat> um, it's a different sort of idol worship. It's the idol of personalities, where back in the day people would actually worship idols like objects, but now it is the, you can say, objects, potential, or personality. And that is in some sense what the lure of many people's attention is going on. So what it means is as the civilization is becoming more sophisticated, we are paying more of an attention to human personality. So believe it or not, before the year 2050, where Ray Kurzweil and some other futurists have suggested that superintelligence is going to open its eyes, before this grand technological revolution happens, we have a certain time period. We have this certain time period where we're not in the know. <clears throat> I feel that every technology that develops does change the texture of the quality of the human experience. Now, anyways, back to this idea of languages. So the human being uses subjective symbol attribution upon an object to carry around the images that we receive from ob objectivity. That means a person sees a sunset, then writes the word sunset, and now that concept, like it was a beautiful sun sunset on the date, like they imagine they write a date. So that sentence is a, is a way where one moment of actual experience of manifestation is being translated in a subtler dimension to echo longer than the actual moment <clears throat> it appeared. So I'm telling you, we are using language 
to endure reality, to keep reality going. Even if the moment passes, we can still talk about it. A lot of human activity and socialization and all this is sharing the events that are happening to people. People like people are creatures on a rock, stuff is happening to us and we talk about it. Sometimes when we talk about something, we allow the same viewpoint to expand or stretch or we get access to new viewpoints. Now, the crucial point that I want to say, because this title is a fascinating title that I don't know how many people will kind of notice that it's as if like lang matter can be the symbol attribution technology for higher dimensional space <clears throat> and so my personal experience in regards to having the relationship uh, with not just the known factors of this world but with its unknown factors I consider that uh, Terence McKenna said it well really he said it better than I can he said there is another tenant in the room and that means that human intelligence is not alone. It doesn't mean there's extraterrestrials or interdimensional beings. It just means that we are not just what we look at. We're not just what we see. There is, there is the seer. There is a mystery of awareness and the uh, confusions that what make us wondrous about consciousness. <clears throat> so this is the simple idea. Just like how you can say... <clears throat> I'm using words right now to communicate. There has been times in my writing where I have felt, literally, I have felt that the sequence, it's a, le it's a level of sensitivity where it's not, you're not looking for language uh, familiarity, like patterns in language. You're not looking to make something into a language. You're kind of wondering life. When I wrote that sentence, why did those sequences of imagery come? So it's a more of an inner sen a sensitivity to you, the inner images that are constituting you as a being. And the way thought arises. You see, the issue of thinking that you're a thought is that it's making you have uh, a blind eye to how life can be a process. A process has a totally different implication than just one particle taking a snapshot of, taking a subjective snapshot of its whole existence in one moment. So I felt while writing that it was as if some space, some space was using uh, some intelligent unknown rhythm of a space was using my thoughts as an alphabet. So imagine the human brain can make certain correlations, relationships, neural networks are developing, right? So what that means is the human being is uh, not just looking at stuff, the mind is imposing its own relationship building mechanism. And that, that relationship me mechanism has two sides where 50% of it is your free will and 50% it's the world, what you gonna do? You know, it's like, you know, you can change <clears throat> the face of your face on Facebook, but you can't change your face in real life. Some things are nature given. They are like nature was like, all right, you're going to look like this. And that person's going to look like that, you know, and it doesn't mean nature has a personality. It doesn't mean we have to suddenly, the moment we don't understand things, suddenly think it's a divine agency. You see the concept of divinity, you can enter it consciously or you can enter it unconsciously. That means, don't think that enlightenment is just uh, years of practice in the thing. It's an instant. Every sage, you, I, I can tell anyone, go and search. Go and search and see what many of these sages and mystics throughout history responded when they, people asked them, hey man, how long does it take to get enlightened? You, do you, what do you think the guy said? The guy, do you think the guy said years and years and years, buddy? You got you to gotta go and uh, do the inner work in the cave. You know, and for some people, it was their time. That means we may not be transmigrating souls, but we are a sort of evolution. And evolution is a sort of tunneling of experiential relativity, where how you experience yourself in a moment, and then from that moment, your next decision is the next uh, room that defines you. So for me, I've had this experience, and especially in uh, two th really my speaking and sp these talks that I give, they kind of originated in 2014, but way before, way before I was giving talks, guys, I was writing. My finger, my hand uh, <clears throat> had written more than I could believe before I started giving these talks. 
And so what I mean by that is that same way we use the alphabet, I had this feeling as if some intelligence in the space of my moment of being, the wave imagery, inner imagery was sequentially arising. It was as if my mind was speaking a language of image, but my personality was translating that language of image into, like for example, English, or when I speak Farsi, it becomes Farsi, or if I choose to communicate in a different way, it becomes a different sort of angle. So what I'm saying was, it, it was this kind of fascinating thing, as if matter is the language of our dimensions, how matter moves, all these mysteries of laws and fields, it's as if it, it is left to the elegant elegance of the intentions of higher dimensional beings. Now these higher dimensional beings, here's the challenge, here's something that every person who was ever fascinated by the concept of the extraterrestrial, of all the extraterrestrial, of the extraterrestrial, of the galactic, of the other, the invisible other, whoever you are on this planet. Let me tell you, human beings, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a too, too much of an uncommon thing. Any human beings, it happens for them. They see human beings on the street walking and so of course the, the child's mind can wonder wait a minute what if there is people walking that I can't see like right now I can't see people in Japan who are walking but does that mean there's no one walking in Japan so it means that there are certain limits to our sensory perception we are appearing on this world as spheres spheres of sensory reception <clears throat> now, for me, what's becoming more fascinating is how is this sphere processing, like pretty much you are um, data processing biomechanism, evolutionary biomechanism, let's say. You are a biological organism that will be kind of look at the language of nature. It's like simpler proteins, it's simpler cells, eventually it becomes uh, pure physics. You know, and eventually when you get to the edge of physics, physics is really... Uh, let me tell you what happens. It's like you reach language. That means <clears throat> I sat down and I wondered and I'm like, all right, if the scientist wants to be certain, that means we are creatures that, uh, <clears throat> let's say, for example, I've seen, I can't tell you how many videos I've seen where the atheist um, was debating the theist and the atheist was pretty much championing science and dismantling the, uh, the theist and it's kind of <laughs> like I will tell you guys I got to share this because it's I think it's worth knowing um, a person who I learned a lot from but in a way that I think no viewer can imagine I learned from his character was a person named Christopher Hitchens <clears throat> And he's a man I respect, and he is pretty much um, eighth, an, an eighth, like he, he is in some sense fighting uh, fundamentalist ignorance, in his view. Now, I remember he was debating this religious scientist, this Christian scientist. And the Christian scientist took the philosophical route of the debate where he was using different conceptual viewpoints to validate the potential that yes this could all be the movement of a higher dimensional being but then christopher hitchens did did a move where if you were watching a chess game it was like checkmate <laughs> christopher hitchens had such class he's he's one of the great orators of our um, of our species you know we should remember him as such <clears throat> and he christopher hitchens came to the poor person who he was, he was kind of debating. And the person had made some incredible, kind of deeply, you can philosophically kind of arguable kind of challenges to how there could be potentially, uh, you know, we can't prove, disprove God, but we can't prove it either, you know, out more, more than outside of our inner realms. So I remember Christopher Hitchens, it becomes his turn to speak, and I was like, yo, this is savage. <laughs> And you know what Christopher Hitchens does? He asked, he asked the gentleman, and the gentleman seemed to be a very intelligent, smart person, you know? But it was that sometimes you are, uh, you are already dressed in your culture. Do you know what I mean? That means people's personalities has a sort of constitution. That means not all your ideas a human being has is just because they've thought about it. Some ideas, they have accepted people 
who have had those thoughts. Do you know, it's, there's an emotional con connection, especially when you are, for example, uh, a religious kid from the East coming to the West, you know, you, you're kind of being introduced to a totally different program of behavior. You know, that means there are, I'm, the world doesn't know. Western culture, perhaps um, what it sees about the Middle East is only in the news. It doesn't see the psychology of human life. You know, and in, in certain cultures, it's as if there's a more, I, I feel the East focused, Eastern enlightenment focused on discipline, Western enlightenment focused on freedom. And it doesn't mean Western Enlightenment didn't have discipline. It just means that freedom was the value first, then discipline. But in Eastern cultures, it was discipline first because of, and then freedom. That means when you were disciplined, you would attain freedom. But in Western countries, you're free. Now be disciplined. <laughs> <clears throat> and so Christopher Hitchens tells the man, you know, he says, he says do you believe in uh, Revelation? And the guy says, yeah. He says, do you believe in angels? The guy says, yeah. He says, do you believe in, you know, Christ being God and whatnot? The guy says, yeah. Then Christopher Hitchens says this, he's, he's so savage. He says, this man has just proved to you how none of his beliefs are based on his empiricism. <clears throat> do you know? Let me tell you, some debaters, they're very advanced. It's as if like, if you were a Buddhist watching that atheist theist debate, you'd kind of be seeing ancient patterns echoing, you know? And what I mean by it's advanced is that you see, you, you, when a person wants to dismiss another, you either dismiss their self or you dismiss their world. If you dismiss their world, it dismisses their self indirectly unless their self is, is strong enough to suddenly adjust the world again. So what that means is when someone comes and speaks to you, you have to be mindful as a human being because what it is, is, is it's like imagery being shared. Now you are the processing, data processor of your intelligence. <clears throat> so that means is the responsibility of your mind, the speakers, that means what you hear as a human being, are you responsible for that meaning you see or is our others, is the speaker. And you see, it's actually you because I have no idea how your eyes are open, dear listener. I just, I am aware of how my eyes are open, do you know? <clears throat> and I've learned that uh, respecting the unknown is the glory of civilization, is the glory of knowledge, really. That means those who don't care for the unknown, you, you will only know what you can hold and nothing more. But when you care for the unknown, it's as if your experience feels a freedom prior to the decision. So in many of my writings, the in, I often speak about my inner realms, and if you've been listening to these talks of mine a while, you kind of get, you'll probably get a sense that when I speak, I'm seeing like an inner film behind my eyes. I often say river of thoughts. You know, there's a movement. It's not just static. <clears throat> now that movement, <clears throat> I have wondered about it. So I have not only wondered about the movement of language in conscious in the conscious waking state, but the movement of the image that leads to the language. And I can tell you that I feel all the content of the human mind, that means everything you know as the person, as a person, it is an alphabet for higher dimensions. Literally, I feel our brains are like ink for higher dimensions, you know, and they're writing. And this doesn't mean that the higher dimensions have a personality. So this is where I'm kind of, I enjoy science fiction as, as much as uh, every person. But I can tell you, there are certain, when it comes to reality, you have to care. Like, the, why, why is there truth in the world? Why does that word exist? <clears throat> because it means that there can be a way we have our attention to the moment. that is irreducible. <coughs> Excuse me.
You know, <clears throat> as someone who's um, that has completed, you know, a degree in film, I can tell you that there was a scene that was phenomenal and I don't believe it or not, I mean, I, I don't remember which movie, I think it was the Crystal Skull one, um, Indiana Jones, the Crystal Skull movie. There's a scene where that, you know, kind of too extreme German lady in the scene gets to see the truth, gets to see what the alien holds and her eyes burn, you know. And that's a very rare moment to see in film. You know, some people, they look at a film, but when you go look at the direction of a film, how to create a film, it's like, it's like writing poetry through images. There's a language, there's a rhythm, there is something behind the eyes of man which appears as the space that moves the matter. And so when are we as a species going to seriously sit down and study the nature of our minds evolving towards the inconceivable? I feel that is the case. And if that is the case, that means this we are blessed. <clears throat> if there are higher dimensions, it automatically means we are blessed. If all the dimensions we have are self-made, it means there's no one to be blessed. I feel matter is symbols for our, is a language for our dimensions. I feel the same way that this is what I meant by meeting Gaia. I feel like I, I'm going to share with you my experience of opening up to the Gaia mind, but uh, Terence McKenna has a lot on it too, you know. Uh, Terence McKenna sees the guy in mind mainly as a feminine archetype. And usually in ancient history it has. Gaia is a female. It seemed like your, that means when people saw the planet, they were like, how, how beautiful is her hair? You know? <laughs> that means it, it came to them as gentleness. Gentleness, you can say, the archetype for gentle. It, like you see, it's like man and, man and woman are like yin and yang. That means they are not made to be the same, but they are made only with an awareness to the other. That means if we as a species lose sight of what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a man, we would be pushed towards a digital androgynous future, which is going to be a bit like, it. I don't think it's the style of our species. Yeah. <clears throat> that means I'm not saying that human beings... Um, uh, their identity is just limited to their genetics, but I'm telling you, if it is not limited to the genetics, then what is it based on? Do you see? And so, it was for example, and again, guys, uh, every person, let me tell you, freedom first, then articulation. Because freedom allows you to see what's there, really. That means I am a person who's speaking at some point, like... <laughs> There's so many human beings identifying with different things. I'm, I'm, I'm that guy who's identifying with attributeless, unknown field of presence. <laughs> Do you know? So I'm telling you that there are various ways that our inner realms can re-relate or rebuild endless new, endlessly new relationships with the external. That means if you as a human being have are depressed and stressed, I am telling you, you're not, you're not, you gotta, you gotta get the wheels of your imagination rolling. Because it's, it is, if a person can't distinguish what is abstract and what is not, they will reduce everything to visibility. Therefore, rendering all potential for other dimensions is void. So you see, it's, it's as if like life and history is people's eyes emerging. And so many people, their eyes have emerged and their eyes have emerged with a sort of DNA, a sort of potential. And uh, welcome everyone uh, who's uh, typing in the chat section. Uh, my attention is on the chat section, but I've decided to kind of like just focus on the talk and 
if anybody has a question, you can uh, ask and I will engage the chat section. But um, this topic uh, is very crucial. You know, I've <clears throat> Beethoven has this quote where he says, don't just practice your art, but force your way into its secrets. For it and knowledge can raise man to the divine. What that means is in your engagement with what your life is being, the ultimate has only one place to be. The here and now is our empire. I feel that matter <coughs> is the elements of our universal sector could be an alphabet. We tend to do that, like how hilarious is this, guys? Even the elements of our, like I am saying that human beings are living in a linguistic simulation. What does that mean? That means when I am alone, I am a moment of sight. When I am with others, I am a character in a story. That's a fascinating distinction. In our solitude, we are the cosmos. But the moment there is another, the world has emerged. And that's why the bridge between the inner realms can be made. And that's what really the internet is. Look at what I'm doing right now. I'm a human being sharing my inner realms with you. Those people commenting are sharing back their inner realms. <clears throat> and so language is that grand bridge. Now, if language is the movement of higher dimensions, and if we think as a species, like when you look at evolution, like I totally understand Darwin, and I know in many, in the educational system, you know, uh, you can, Charlie Sheen can look at Darwin and say, Darwinning. <laughs> uh, you know, this joke is a couple of years too late, but. <laughs> <clears throat> and so what it is, is that, I feel evolution is the strange, strange, mysterious attempt of a temporary creature to endure eternally, is it not? Why are we surviving to remain? And you see, that's the honor of the species. I am telling you, uh, nationalism was very crucial to the development of individual languages because people were pretty much speaking their own dialects and when na national kind of gave them their identity, they realized they were part of something, it became important to also learn what you're a part of. So what that means is um, it was as if like there was a war of different separate languages and through nationalism, suddenly the armies that won the language war, they kind of came forth. And then suddenly the, the main languages of the world developed. You see, it's, there's always multidimensional chaos jumping into singular order. And after singular order has gotten bored with eons of singular order, it will jump back into multidimensional chaos. And what that means is the Buddha and the Bodhisattva are two sides of the same coin. And this may be a strange idea, but it's kind of like saying that how do you know you're an individual? Because you first has to have to have an understanding of the concept of collective. So actually before any decision a human being makes, you are both, <clears throat> you're the potential for both. So from a moral like when we're considering a sort of moral landscape or how human beings are perceiving the world and considering what is right and wrong, what is correct and what is flawed, you see, that's your morality. Right now, if you're listening to me and you're like, what, you know, this, what, you know, you see me as a bad man, <laughs> you know, that's your morality. And if you, if you see me as a good person, that's your morality. And when you really look at the good and the bad, they are codependent. They are like night and day. You can't know what the light is if you don't know the darkness. You cannot know what the darkness is if you don't know the light. And inevitably, after this cycle of constantly, oh no, chaos, oh no, oh yeah, order, oh no, chaos, oh yeah, order, oh no, chaos, oh yeah, order, for how long will attention move in this hamster wheel? So morality will evolve to multidimensional, 
uh, uh, care to wonder about the experience of all individuals in the system. <clears throat> that means when a person wants a healthy body, they don't want just you know one part of their body to be healthy. They want the whole body has to be healthy. Do you see? And when you kind of look at your species and you're like, what's a healthy species? What's an advanced civilization look like? You want your whole civilization to be advanced. That means the system has to still be um, <clears throat> like kind of um, still in the prototype phase. That means like you don't attempt it until you have built a weapon strong enough to combat the challenge. <clears throat> And I don't know, I think it follows like Nordic uh, legends where it's kind of like Thor's hammer was made in, in, in like in the furnaces that were the hearts of dying stars or something. You know, it's like badass. But <laughs> I feel we don't just have access to perceiving objective phenomena move. We have access to perceiving subjective phenomena to move. And I feel you be, you realize yourself as an advanced communicator, as an advanced communicator, when, when you kind of realize you're actually technically nature before you were named. It's like, who were you before you were named? You know, it's like, I don't know, probably. <laughs> It's like, imagine they ask you, what's your name? And you're like, I don't know. And they're like, what? You don't know your name? He's like, no, my name is I don't know. <laughs> oh, man, that's funny. <laughs> the world is kept in hierarchies. It is kept in uh, spectrums. And when you understand this, that every environment you go has its own introduction to the hierarchy that means what i found very fascinating that even though people are living with different ideologies around the world but they are kind of limited to human experience if you notice right this is why when someone comes to speak about the imagination we all wonder uh, you know where our thoughts are dancing when we have them and it is too easy to reduce it because I consider materialism to be one step away from nihilism. That means you're you're going towards like your hands have gone into the event horizon. That means the materialist the materialist can see meaninglessness, but doesn't mean you can't create meaning in life. <clears throat> this is why I'm saying that uh, the more materialistic you become, I feel the more art is is uh, the activation of your senses. So I'm pretty much saying our thoughts, when we are selfless, appear to be to being moved by the rhythms of a field. We are a symbiosis of uh, particles uh, moving in a field. It's like we, we think the river is moving because the leaf is creating it. We will realize, no, the leaf is moving because of the unknown river. The leaf is our knowledge. It is all the libraries of humanity. So I want you to imagine that regardless of how much you in this world have seen people and think they're, they know what they're doing, the species is standing in the unknown. And so certainty, it, it has to be like uh, a declaration of the inner realms. That means when your inner realms mature, you automatically act. When your inner realms are still at war, what does that mean? That means you still haven't understood the yin-yang symbol. Um, you're going to fight yourself in others. That means if I ask you, have you ever gotten angry at people? Most people will say, yeah. You know, and if you haven't, you know, it's like, uh, maybe you will one day. <laughs> but what it is, is really, I'm saying that you actually have never been angry at anyone else. Check this out, guys. Anytime you have behaved to another human being, you have not had their eyes. So who have you been angry at? 
Who have you been seeing? You have been seeing your extraction, your whatever patterns of recognition your intelligence has, 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 has uh, walked through so far. So I, when I realize every time I've gotten angry at someone, I've gotten angry at my limited vision of their limitless potential. Do you see? And believe it or not, from another angle, if your mind, if I ask you where is your mind right now, you'll be like, it's my whole moment, Mr. what are you saying? Like, my mind is this. You know? <laughs> and I'll tell you, if your mind is being your whole moment, who are you hurting then when you hurt the other? Do you see? Do you see that unless your mind is certain that you have put down, you have declared as a human being uh, that violence is an inefficient technology, uh, I feel that uh, the guy in mind will not find you because the guy in mind is not the animalistic urge. It's not... It, it's the field that is moving the animal. <clears throat> and I'm saying this is an unknown field. That means the field is the best word I have right now. In the future generations, children might, uh, hopefully language will evolve to a point where uh, right now we are not as a species consciously evolving language. What that means is most people are based on the cultural program using language. You know, and because, <laughs> you know, we can't ignore it. I mean, like, what is the attention of most human beings on? You know? <laughs> it's, it's, on, it's on either evolving, uh, enduring the self or enduring the world. Now, I do consider a problem, guys, when it comes to uh, trying to, as Carl Jung said, uh, you know, unless you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. That means we're a, a creature in a conscious waking moment. And in this moment of life, we have to attempt from this moment's awareness uh, watch the world, walk in the world. So what that means is, think of it this way, no animal, no species in this world has this advanced of an awareness to itself and its world. We are the most advanced creature here. You know, you deny this, um, if you deny this, then you have not looked at your species good enough, you know. So we are the most advanced being. After 4 billion years, we've had and you know 250,000 years of sophistication of civilization arising. We right now have all these advanced technologies at our disposal, but how are we choosing to live? There's an opportunity here that is letting that something in life is letting it just be wasted. There is sometimes when you go try to fulfill a so a, a, a perp a, an individual life purpose. Uh, you miss out on the collective life. And I am telling you, we've evolved for the collective life, not the individual life. <clears throat> you can say the before language, um, I made this point um, in other talks that linguistic professors have said there was meaning before there was language. What does that mean? That means regardless of if I say something or not, if I give it a symbol or not, there's meaning. Meaning is experiential. Did you not know?
So the linguistic professor is kind of saying, like, you could totally kind of get the idea that we, are, and we opened up to our inner realms at some point in history, and then that inner realm couldn't be communicated because we hadn't languages yet. We haven't developed languages yet. So it's kind of like wondering how cavemen would speak to one another, and it was probably just bursts of loud sound. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, ah, oh, you know, like something. <laughs> You know, it's it's very hard to do a caveman impression, guys, you know. Because who knows what kind of sound they made. It could have all been high-pitched squeals, who know. <laughs> you know, it could have, caveman noise could totally not be a grunt, you know. <clears throat> but what it was, was it was an effort to make sound, at least. So that effort to make sound came that there was eyes uh, within the being that wanted to step out. There, were, there was something the creature wanted to share that it found it only knew that the other didn't know, that it felt like that's why we were designed to speak. I feel that if there was an extraterrestrial species, or if there were, you know, that means Fermi's paradox is, is, is this incredible idea where Fermi was like, he was very observant and he was like, where are they? It's like, <laughs> Why is it all so empty? Why are we? Why are we the special ones? And so where is everybody? Where are they? It's Fermi's paradox. Now, one has to consider... Let's say that means there's a 50-50 chance. Maybe the aliens are hiding in the shadows of the cosmos. We can't see them. Maybe they see us. Maybe we can't see them. Maybe one day we will see them and they can't see us. Do you know? <clears throat> so... Now, this idea that if an extraterrestrial species was observing humanity, it would be like, holy shit, after so long in space, if they were an advanced civilization, they would be grateful we are here. Not, they would not come to invade us. They would come to introduce themselves to us. Introduce our eyes to grander galactic systems. You know, in my dream states, guys, I had, like in, my, in a dream of mine, like, it was one of the most fascinating dreams. Like, I've had some, what I would consider, like, uh, uh, like, no film can touch kind of dreams, you know? <laughs> you know? And in those dreams, I can, in, in this dream, I had the most, I have never shared this on, in these talks, guys, but now I think this is going to be the first episode to do so. I had a dream, guys, where it was this desert-like, sand-like world, and on it, there was this giant, giant, uh, a bit extraterrestrial looking, but not, not like, uh, like jellyfish extraterrestrial, more like geometrical, uh, uh, more, le less detailed kind of giant being, and human beings, it what appeared as like human looking beings to me, or hu like human format, uh, creatures that had the sort of humanoid format, you know, they were all like, I can't tell you guys, this dream, it was like, imagine seeing a giant, giant alien, and seeing that in the leg, like where the thigh, where the outer thigh, or let's say left, <clears throat> Pretty much imagine like <sighs> Sorry guys, I'm finding it a bit difficult to explain this. Um pretty much imagine a giant giant, you know, being tall, you know. Uh, just standing, and in the leg, in, in the left part of the leg, like above the knee, 
of this giant being, like an, imagine if so, there was a cubic tunnel made, okay? So it was as if this being was the ship, was the civilization. That means, like right now, we are really mechanically dependent. Our technologically, our civilization is as a technological one. You know, that means the pretty much the way we come, we advance it is we, we overpopulate, then we really look at the problems and then we contribute and then something happens, you know? But this was as if like, it was the first time I was seeing the infusion of a being as a being a building. It was like the in, infusion of the archetype of a spaceship with an actual being, giant being. You know, and it was a dream, of course, guys. It was like something I saw in my dream, but but like, um, it was very unique. That and in that gap in the leg of this giant being, there were people, like thousands of people, standing. You know, it was it was it was a very odd dream, but it was something that I consider it was my unconscious. That means when you dream, the unknown mind is speaking to you. And some people say they don't remember your, their dreams because you don't remember uh, for anyone's voice. You don't remember what um, any... Uh, if you don't care for someone, you don't care. So you don't remember. If you care, you will remember. If you care, you know. You'll, that's how knowing happens. Tell me uh, one Shaolin monk who didn't care for the craft. You know? You succeed in any work when you care for it. That's the secret, guys. When you care for it, then at some point, you apply your own style. When you apply your own style, it's, it's a bit of a rush um, because you don't know if the world embraces it or not. So you're like, all right, let's see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> That was um, one of the most fascinating dreams that I'd had. It was another fascinating dream I had was, which inspired me to write this book in 2000, uh, I think it was late 12, 2012, where in a dream I had, a, I saw literally, you know how you see stars at night? Now imagine those stars in a line all moving and like as if it wasn't a bunch of lines moving. So I saw moving stars for a glimpse, for a snapshot moment in a dream state where I suddenly noticed those aren't stars, those are ships and like as if with a gasp in the dream I awoke in the bed, you know, and I, I, I've written the book, it's a, it's a strange book uh, I wrote in 2013 where I was uh, more dressed in new age ideas. For me, it's just been preferencelessness at some point in my life made me aware that something else is moving other than me. I started caring for that. Eventually, I trusted my mind. When I trusted my mind, it began to move in new ways. When the mind moved in new ways, it could no longer be changed by its past. When it was no longer changed, like when I felt like literally my past didn't matter as much as my future did because there's there's something guys there's there's something that makes the present moment glorious and it is only its potential that means hope is how in another dimension the wrong is not happening so that means your mind in any system let's say you suddenly open your eyes i'll share with you a chapter in my science fiction novel I have this character named Rasol, and he has this kind of Native American, um, uh, kind of shamanic personality, a robotic friend. His name is Justicar Nova. He's pretty much this robot that has is dressed like a shaman, like has tribal clothing on. 
and he's conducting these, uh, he, he, how can I tell you, like, um, anyways, he's a very important figure. He brought some huge transformations in society of how to treat robots. So he pretty much uh, is, is known as one of the most famous robots in the robotic realms, which is something of this science fiction novel I've created set in the year 5025. So <clears throat> what happens... If I remember correctly, Rousseau uh, and Justica Nova, they've stepped down out of this chapter called The Ocean on the Mountain Peak, um, which I've shared in other talks. But this is the chapter after where they are coming down the mountain, this robot in Rousseau. And I'm not going to tell you the details of uh, how Rousseau looks like. I want you as the listener, you can imagine it, you know. So in this chapter, what happens is suddenly Jessica Nova, because he's a robot, he instantly just robots in the story, they get instant messages. So they automatically know what's going on. <clears throat> so the road, Jessica Nova says the Sky City Council wants to see us, see us both, you know, and Rasol is, is like, you'll see him. He's a character I've designed in the story where it's he is. He doesn't resist nature and nature moves on. That's the, that's the archetype of his character. He is, he's kind of the soul of light, you know? So Rasol, this man, he's a man though, he's a human being. And human beings live thousands of years in this story of mine. They don't live just a couple of years. Now, what happens is that two black um, uh, colored uh, suits that look like um, the Iron Man suit, but with a, a kind of angelic light, lightsaber-like wings, okay, appear out of the sky and they open up. And for the first time, Rasol goes into the suit and Justa Carnova, which is an incredible concept where a robot is going into a robot suit. Okay, <clears throat> and that's kind of like their vehicle to the Sky City Council that has called them. Now, Rasul has a vision. I don't remember what I wrote his vision was. He has some unique vision that the vision is very, like, significant. He's, he sees a mysterious character. I think, <clears throat> I don't remember who it was I chose. But, but anyways, so suddenly imagine this, that the suit opens up. And from the darkness inside the suit, Rasul opens his eyes and Justin Carnot opens his eyes and they're above the clouds. And there's no city, it's just clouds. Okay? Now, what happens... Let me see if I remember. Um... They walk, they walk from the cloud, they walk on the clouds, they don't fall. The suits suddenly vanish. They just, as if they drop themselves, they go out of the cloud. So you kind of see the suits go back into the clouds, you know, go down. And then Rasul and Justin Carnova are walking. And the whole point of the Sky City Council is that it's an invisible building. And suddenly the building becomes, suddenly this door in the middle of the clouds becomes visible and Rasul and Justin Carnova walk into the door and the moment they walk into the door, it's this grand majestic hall, which is the Sky City Council, where it actually at this point in the story, the, the most important beings uh, all around the galaxy that have, are there. And so when they go into the Sky City Council, oh my God, it's so cold. <laughs>
they see as they go in the hall, the head of the, so a government in the science fiction novel I've created in the year 5025 is called the Enlightened Society. And they are the first multidimensional government. They're not just governing one parallel dimension of Earth, but pretty much all the parallel dimensions of Earth. And there are the artists where the Enlightened Society was inspired by poli the first politician that was an artist. This politician wasn't a, a, a like a politician or a law major. This politician was just an artist. It was it was inspired out of the first artist that became you know, you know, a leader. <clears throat> and so the enlightened society treats everything as art. So so in some sense cares for everything. At the same time, tells the people of the world you must care for the artwork of the world as well. You know. It has this like enlightened. I remember I wrote a lot about how it's that how it came about the enlightened society. Now, when they go in this hall, the head of the enlightened society is pretty much a being of light. That means you can't see him. He's he's just an outline of light. <clears throat> that means he's kind of like he looks like a human being, but there's no like you can't see any details to his skin and body. It's just light. And he's sitting in the enlightened, he's sitting on this chair and his hands on his chin. So you see his, this light elbow on the throne, kind of like a set, kind of space, the hall of the Sky City Council. <clears throat> now, the moment Rasul enters, there's some strange character that's giving a talk already. So when Justice Nova and Rasul enter, there's someone speaking. And everybody's quietly listening. And who's speaking? This character I've created, which I feel is one of the coolest characters, his name is Captain Fino. Okay? <laughs> and people are going to be like, Captain Fino? And I'll tell you, in my story, animals have been given rights to access advanced AI technology, you know, advanced technology to speak. So it's pretty much a dolphin in a kind of human-looking but more bigger robotic suit, like with a capsule of water. And that's Sergeant Fino. He's a dolphin. Okay? He's a dolphin connected to advanced technology, which now has a personality and has a position and is actually in the story. He's, he's like this kind of funny character, but he's the leader. He's pretty much unionizing, like uniting all the animals, all the animals uh, in all the parallel dimensions for the enlightened society. He's, he's, he's an important figure. You know, he's, he's like the connection to the animal dimension I've tried to capture, the evolution of animal life. <clears throat> so, what happens is um, Sergeant Fino suddenly stops, he sees Rasul, and everyone in the book already kind of strangely knows. All the different characters already know who Rasul is. It's some, there's some, something unique I've done with the character design there. <clears throat> You'll see it develop in the book, but I'll tell you this. Rasul um, goes there and uh, Captain Fino says, a wise one, and Justicar Nova is there. He's like the ambassador of the robotic realms. And there's a character which I've, I've dedicated a chapter. I, will, I think I shared in one of the talks. It's, it's called, he's called Lord Carta, and he's this golden being, you know, where, where he has four hands, but he has two legs. Okay, he has four hands, but two legs. And he's this golden-skinned being, you know? And uh, he has this gladiator kind of like helmet. And he's in the story, all the suns in the solar system, they are actually part of the most powerful, one of the most powerful galactic forces, which I called it the Central Sun Legion. So Lord Carta is like one of the royalty of the Central Sun Legion. And he's come to the Sky City Earth Council because... And uh, a strange cosmic event is occurring, which uh, galactic event is occurring in the story I'm going to tell you, like in a couple seconds, bro. So when they go there, suddenly so Captain Fino stops. They welcome Rasul and Justice Carnova, and Lord Carter is sitting there. He's, you know, um, uh, as one of the great commanders of the Central Sun Legion. <clears throat> So pretty much their uh, suns are headquarters for the central sun region all around the galaxies. Because in my science fiction, guys, suns are the greatest tools for disseminating information. 
That means if it's like a way where if a species, an advanced species, wanted to uh, repopulate the cosmos, it would do it through the sun's light, for example. So, anyways, uh, in the enlightened society, suddenly there's like these, I don't know, I, I don't know if I chose screens or holograms, well, no, probably holograms. Uh, the head of the Enlightened Society looks at Rasul and Jessica Nova and tells them that there are nine giants, white ethereal giants, kind of ghost-like looking giants, in space, moving towards Earth. And Lord Carter and many other uh, heads of galactic agencies who are at the Sky City Council, they've come here because they feel like something strange is happening. So imagine our species, our planet, having allies that are galactic civilizations that in a time of like something strange event is happening to our planet, our galactic allies are, uh, are coming to accompany us. It's like that's kind of like the Sky City Council vibe. <clears throat> now these nine giants are coming, okay? They're coming and Rasul suddenly gets a vision. He gets a vision where it's as if this gust of wind out of nowhere appears around him and suddenly imagine like, like as this wind out of nowhere appears in this hall, you know, this windowless hall, you know, and Rasul gets a vision and he suddenly, you know, kind of as, as the head of the enlightened society, that light guy, <laughs> that guy, um, He's kind of explaining the situation. Rasul gets a vision, and I don't remember exactly what the vision was, but what happens next is he suddenly says, I immediately need a galactic crew, a, a space crew, to take me into this exact location, right? So Rasul gets this kind of intuitive, mystical vision. Now, in that moment, Lord Carta, which is a very, like, kind of, a warrior kind of general commander of armies kind of personality you know Lord Carter suddenly comes and says what is this you know he, he thinks he, he, he feels Rasul suddenly gets a vision and says I know what's going on and it's like the situation is so mysterious that Lord Carter is getting angry and he's, he's kind of like challenging Rasul in that moment he's saying what is this what vision this is nonsense don't waste my time like he as if you know He's got that kind of ego. Now, what happens is that Rasul in that moment just sits down, raises his hand in the air. He's kind of, his legs are like crossed, like he's sit, sitting down. He raises his hand and suddenly, one, one of his hands, his right hand, and he suddenly makes his right hand into a fist and this flash happens and everybody sees that vision. And I, I wasn't going to say it, but I'll tell you, it's like the vision is kind of like, um, how one of the parallel dimensions of Earth is taken by this Darkon species. Darkon is like they have, they're the evil in the this, in this story, pretty much. This advanced kind of insect looking species that are infused with electricity and smog, you know. So when they invade planets, you just see this giant spirals of uh smoke and whatnot kind of come you know so what happens is everybody in the room suddenly when they see how messed up the darkons have invaded this unknown parallel dimension of earth do you know that the enlightened society didn't even know about lord carter doesn't cry he doesn't fall down but pretty much everybody gets shocked the moment his uh, rousseau closes his fist and there's that flash <clears throat> and the Enlightened Society guy is light, so you don't see any facial gesture. <laughs> but what happens is this is the scene. This is why I, I, was, I was sharing the science fiction novel, just to build it up to this one moment to explain to you as a kind of point I was trying to make in the talk. Okay, so Rasul, as he's coming to the Sky City Council and suddenly everybody sees what Rasul saw, he pretty much shared his inner realms in an instant. The Sky City Council gives Rasul a ship, and so Rasul alone is in a ship, and everybody is there.
Now what happens is Rasul with a crew, there's like a pilot and some staff like in the ship and the ship is taking Rasul into space to this certain location. Now something strange happens and everybody is seeing, the enlightened society is even watching, watching Rasul do this. He's like, I just have to go instantly as if he's got a vision. And so he's going. And so when what happens is the next moment, guys, this is the cool part of the chapter, where suddenly one of those nine giants appears. One of those nine giants appears right beside the ship and you see his giant hand coming to take the ship. And the pilot and the staff are all freaking out. Everybody in the Enlightened Society who's watch, uh, in, in the Sky City Council who's watching is alarmed. And suddenly the hand goes through the shape, uh, ship like a ghost hand. Do you know? But then they see Rasul is, Rasul is missing from the ship. The hand took Rasul literally out of the ship. Right? And the next moment you see Rasul is out of his body. He's pretty much sight looking at his body in the hand of this, what do you call it, uh, in the hand of this giant. And the giant tells him, pass the test and throws him. And Rasul, just with his body, but as a sight outside of his body, is thrown, and that next chapter is he's thrown in the middle of a battlefield. And that was my whole point I was trying to make. That's life throws you into a battlefield. And I remember this chapter and I felt like sharing, you know. But like, that's the thing. And what happens in that chapter, I'll give you a preview. He's thrown in the middle of a battlefield where suddenly he just opens his eyes and he sees all the soldiers of these two armies, extraterrestrial armies fighting. But suddenly two orbs, a blue and a yellow orb, suddenly, imagine like in the crowd of the war, suddenly Rasul is thrown. He's thrown into another planet, you know. As the, the, and the giant was like, pass this test. So this chapter is the test that he passes. And what happens is in that moment, these two giant orbs come and literally in, come to devour Rasul. These giant orbs of light. Not giant, like, like, like maybe like a, like a meter above Rasul's head would be. Like, you know, where the edge of the sphere would be. If Rasul was inside. So pretty much in the middle of this battlefield, a blue and a yellow uh, sphere come and start fighting for his, his being, right? For, start fighting for his life force, like two vicious animals divine. So and how I wrote it in the story is that in that moment, Rasul, he's out of his body. He's, he's, it's like he's, he's space. Well, he's looking as he's, he's the eyes of space at that moment. He's in the story, you'll see that Rasul is, um, it's his first incarnation uh, in, in this, in, in, as a human being, his, his past life, I've entertained that idea, and even there's future lives in the story. Um, his past life, he was just the consciousness of a galaxy. He was just a vastness, a vast sky of sight, you know? And this is, this whole book is of his incarnation as a, what do you call it? human being and while those two spheres just add this before I uh, you know move out of the sci-fi in that moment where he's caught between the spheres if you saw a Venn diagram two circles and that middle space that's connected between the two circles Rasul's consciousness is trapped between these two realms and what's happening to his physical body is in every instant it is being completely destroyed then completely created again. Completely destroyed like as if the pull of one sphere is destroying every cell of his body and then in the other pull of the sphere is creating. So he's, his physical body is literally watching it as space is literally being endlessly in every instant being created, destroyed, created, destroyed. He's experiencing uh, apocalypses to the infinite speed of infinity, literally, in that moment. <clears throat> and but, but in his inner realms, Rasul sees those two spheres are two beings. And they walk up to him and one of them, uh, I remember, explains themselves, introduces himself. Uh, uh, yeah, introduces himself as the Yellow Dawn, 
and the other introduces herself as the blue sunset. <coughs> and uh, that chapter I'm going to leave for later. And so, yeah, sometimes in life, we open our eyes in an intelligent system. There's so many things going on before we even know what we are, before we can understand who is looking at itself in the mirror. <clears throat> oh, <laughs> so welcome to the chat section, guys. Now I'm seeing... Uh, Oh, it's not Captain Female, guys. It's Captain Female, a dolphin. So Captain, I'll, I'll put it all here. It's Captain Female. <laughs> you know, it's like I, I just took the word fin and I just put an O at the end, okay? <laughs> that's, that's, that's how Captain Female was named, guys, you know? The cool thing about writing um, like a novel is that you are actually naming characters. You're naming fiction, fictitious people. <laughs> so, um, Captain Fino is a dolphin, you know. Um, and, hello William, hello Dankman. <laughs> So, Nicholas says, what's the population of Earth and Earth-like planets in the year 5025? <sighs> Let me tell you this. In this, this novel, something, the way I wrote it, was I decided, because I'm alive once, I'm going to give myself full freedom. So, in this book, you find angels, you find uh, uh, oversouls to planets, you find robotic beings, you find uh, galactic beings, you find star beings. You know, there's a lot about how cyberspace culture uh, is existing, you know. You find human beings that are, uh, how can I tell you, they are half human, half, half machine, you know. You find a human being that is like, there's all the, does any, okay guys, I'm going to take, uh, ask a question. Would the audience like to hear another chapter? Or uh, should I continue with the talk, with the top theme of the talk? And that chapter is called, uh, what did I call it? I don't remember the name of the chapter, but I remember the chapter. <laughs> Anyways, guys, what can I say? You know, computers and our phones and the internet seems to be the most advanced external technology. Actually, not the most advanced, the second, the mo most advanced external technology we're being, actually. Our biology, our brain. You know, don't underestimate the human intelligence it has uh, built civilizations. <laughs>
In Greek mythology, the world began from chaos, Kronos, which is the father of Zeus. And then there is this kind of, I don't know, lineage that opens up and Gaia is born. And the Gaia in mind, its feminine attribute comes from there. And order came. So that means chaos first, then order. So as if chaos is unconsciousness. And then order uh, is our conscious, where our conscious self is. So what does that mean? That means that attempt to, like Carl Jung, Make the unconscious conscious is an attempt, attempt to make, to expand the conscious mind towards its inseparability as the unconscious. So what that means is at some point the war of uh, the known and the unknown ends. And when that war ends, I feel it's like the whole value of this universe comes to a null point. Do you know? I feel... Um, There is more than what we can see going on. And that's the thing that will always make our certainty wonder of the abstract. So I feel that when we look at, like, even through a scientific lens, the laws of nature are moving you, correct? Like gravity is acting upon us. So on, on some sense, in some sense, we can say, uh, and... The, and, and at least to us, invisible force is moving our atoms. We, I think scientifically that's a valid idea, you know, that it's, it's a force that's moving us. The gravity is a force acting upon an object. And it's as if the earth is so massive that things are just pulled to it, you know. It's like you want to leave Earth, and Earth is like, no, you can't go. <laughs> Don't leave me. <laughs> and that's why gravity is. Gravity is like, um, you know, imagine how many daughters back in the day had to say goodbye to their fathers when their father had to go to war. You know, like villages were sieged. You know, there was, there was someone who I, 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 I learned, so, like, I can tell you, sometimes a person's life story is enough for you to see libraries, you know. And uh, I think it was Archimedes, and I, that's the best way I can pronounce it, but he was this mathematician that he came to a village and suddenly the village was under siege and he was using catapults and uh, gears and certain... He was using math to defeat the, you know, to defend the city. And he did. And he defended it like a badass, you know, like mathematician. You know, who says a mathematician can't defend the kingdom, you know? <laughs> and um, his story is actually phenomenal because at the end of his life, he's on a beach and he's, he's trying to solve. He's, he's caught on to one of like uh, an important mathematical kind of inquiry and right before he finds the answer there's a roman soldier and he tells the roman soldier let me solve this math problem and then kill me and then the roman soldier just kills him which is messed up you know but that's the story or as uh, i i feel that's historically accurate but anyways
really guys, the inspiration for this talk was that I, I saw that I had had an experience where I had felt the image of my inner realms was moving not in accordance to the pace of my own thinking. So sometimes I've, I've noticed the movement of thought and its speed. Like, you know, I have a lot of opinions on the speed of the inner realms. And what that means is uh, regardless of like, like, let's say even the physical realms, when a person gets pushed, something happens in the inner realms. So it's kind of like the more you study yourself as unknown attention where known phenomena is in, the more you kind of get a sense of how your inner realms work. You know, <clears throat> I'm telling you right now, it's pretty cool. And I feel everybody should actually be communicating. You know, like what I mean by that is that any human being who has attempted to share the inner realms, I mean, you've pretty much done what the greatest authors did. No? So, so that's the thing. That's the point that now our inner realms like check it out guys we're living in an objective world the outer realm okay now in front of your eyes that's how i'm distinguishing the inner realm and the outer realm what you see in front of your eyes is the outer realm what is appears as uh, behind the eyes or not local to sensory perception is your inner realms I can tell you that um, in my youth, divinity had the concept of divinity had not been dismissed. Uh, there was a time I came where it got dismissed. The moment I got introduced to secular society, the moment I read the uh, writings and kind of looked into history of how people existed in Europe, you know. And I got access to, you know, for example, uh, how can I tell you, stretching from Voltaire, Oscar Wilde, um, many who I see their personalities, I can't remember the names, but... <laughs> I notice the sort of freedom to a sort of, like, let me tell you, I, I think people are not just trying to succeed. They're trying to release themselves from, from the burdens of their yesterday. That's why meditation is popular, because stress is being built in the system. Now, this stress is like, let's say the stress becomes, the pressure becomes to such a degree where if, you, if the person, like, usually this is what happens. If the person doesn't feel free in their external realms, their inner realms are going to question their own freedom. So they're going to judge themselves. So then the judgment and self, self loop begins. The loop of constantly seeing a lesser self. The mind has the potential to see the, uh, the most inefficient and it has the potential the instant it sees the most inefficient to see the most efficient. Do you know? That means imagine you were an immortal being with the concept of failure exists. <laughs> It's like, how can an immortal being fail? Just keep going, buddy. <laughs> you know, it, guys, immortal beings need inspiration too. You know? <laughs> so anyways, I'm, I'm telling you that um, uh, we all as human beings must put in effort and we have care. Like most people care about their appearance. They care about their... Uh, lifestyle, they care about the different dimensions of life they experience while they're here, you know, so there is that, there is that we care for the appearance of, our, of, of who we are. Now, I am wondering, okay, we're caring for the appearance, but how much are we caring for the presence? That means I have seen some of the coolest art, uh, archetypes, personalities, but I have also seen how little they see. 
that means something can be alluring, but it doesn't mean it can, it, can, it has depth. That means, for example, I remember I went to the uh, MoMA in New York, just like a, it was a school trip. And when I was in uh, MoMA, New York, we went and I remember I saw this painting where pretty much I was like, all right, this, this is like, this, uh, this painting should be, they should write underneath it. This painting is famously here because it was done by the laziest artist. And it was literally as if the artist had accidentally spilled paint on the canvas. <laughs> you know, and I was like, okay, you call this art now? <laughs> and uh, there was also this other artist who had used his head, uh, his hair as paint and drawn a line on a roll of paper on a street. And I felt that was real art, actually, because it, w it had a sort of mixture of uh, the strange and the unknown, which uh, there, was a, there was also an insanity to it. I mean, like that probably, that guy's head hurt after that. Like that man sacrificed the surface of his head, you know, for art. Like, that's pure art. Really, guys, I I don't know what to say, but I feel eventually it's going to be a, definitely a philosophical challenge that we have to collectively overcome. And it is the implication of intelligence moving beyond the format of the human structure. And, if, and I don't know, like I'm trying to get people not to get excited because there's a treasure in the unknown. We, are, we should like ghouls search for it. Do you know, I, you should never enter the unknown like a hungry animal. Like, that's very rude, I feel, to the unknown. <laughs> Do you know? And it's the resurfacing of the grand realization of the unknown. That means we're oscillating. That means there was a time where literally it was unconscious movement as nature. It was unknown. Existence was unknown to itself. Now existence is known to itself as if we've reached a peak of uh, the rise of civilization and existence, it, 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 the crystallization and more sophistication of existence, like how it's becoming more complex. So it was like, first it was a creature was unknown, the intelligence on this earth was unknown to itself. Then it became known to itself. Now me and you have, have become alive in the middle of this kind of like, arrow towards the peak of knowledge, right? And I feel this was, um, Terence McKenna had a point here about the transcendental object at the end of time, but I, I um, like I'm gonna do injustice to what he said because I have my, my own experiential opening to it. So um, anyways, the unknown, uh, it's a phase, you know, sine wave, this, imagine this, um, uh, kind of uh, the peak of this sine wave is knowledge. Now, when we reach that peak, it's going to suddenly come back to the unknown. 
So what I'm saying is right now we are in a phase of the cosmic activity where it is, it is like there, there is the potential to be known to yourself. Knowledge exists in this part of the universe. Okay, but it, it, it's knowledge through more intelligent activity, just activity in the static. So I'm saying at the evolution of this, that means in like, I don't know, maybe like 10,000 years, we're not going to be even shapes. Do you see what I mean? Again, we return to the, from the inconceivable arises the conceivable, and then the conceivable returns to the inconceivable. So right now we're in a conceivable point and we have through language kind of, what can I say? <sighs> language is our way of uh, storing experience. So that's the thing guys, that's So meeting the Gaian mind or meeting Gaia is literally how the personality is returning to a field of being. So the less you do, the more you feel the planet moving. The less you, in, in some sense, attempt to be something, you are something already. And most people who uh, devalue what they are, they don't understand that they have not even given their mind a chance. That's the thing. You, 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 it's like, who, who has the responsibility to come and move your eyes? <laughs> Do you know, that means like the teacher, the teacher, uh, you know, that comes to the classroom. I remember when I was in um, my, for like three years in, ex I experienced middle school, like in Iran. And, uh, <laughs> in this school called Tehran International School, okay? It was like pretty much the only English, uh, Swiss IB based kind of school in Iran, right? And, The teacher literally came to class. It was this really like relaxed guy. He, everybody liked this teacher. He was the biology teacher, you know? And uh, he came and the way the class was built was kind of strange. It had like these unique tables, you know? Um, like two, two person tables. And then the teacher's t uh, table was like made of stone connected to the wall. Yeah. <laughs> And then it was the chalkboard. And this teacher would just come in class and he would just write all the notes the kids needed to know, okay, on the board. And he would tell the kids to write. And then he would just go sit, work on his phone as key people started writing. Then after a while, he would come and in some sense, How can I tell you? It was like um, he would go and talk to each individual student alone. And there was something very unique there, you know, in, in his teaching method. 
where it's as if he would share the content, then he would go look at the experience. Yeah. But probably he needed to know more English as a teacher, like that's definitely. <laughs> Anyways, guys, um, if there's any questions on what I've said, so I feel like I, this is really a new concept that are that matter could be a language for a higher dimensional space. Okay, and what would that higher dimensional space be? And is do can our languages even fathom it? I've created the word the language threshold for this. That the language threshold is beyond our understanding. So what do we do with what we don't know? And most people, they don't care for the unknown. They don't, they, 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 they look at the unknown and they're like, all right, there's nothing there, you know? <laughs> and they, they run towards the system of knowledge that is most valued. That's the cultural program. The cultural program is, you know, someone mentioned the Hunger Games. It's like the Hunger Games of archetypes, of personalities. That means most people are living for their abstract life. They're not living for what is really there. What an incredible quote. Thanks for sharing that, Nicholas. So guys, Nicholas in the chat section has shared a Mar uh, Mar Martin Luther King quote uh, and Martin Luther King Jr. And he says, everything we see is a shadow cast by that which we do not see. Yeah. The known and the unknown are two sides of the same coin. That means right now you, you are seeing a known way of I, I, well, you're seeing the known component, like wh what I'm communicating, but right now you don't see who I am. So it's like, it's like an, there's an unknown, uh, the simultaneously as there's the known. And most people freak out. I feel that subconsciously. This was in one of my kind of, I consider it an epic theory, you know, that everybody's reacting to emptiness. Everybody is shocked behind their personality that it isn't empty. And we realize, no, you're the privilege for it to be full. <clears throat> so in the process of whatever you take or do intensely, you'll suddenly see your nature in it, you know? This was something that um, the European philosophers and writers, I was telling you about it earlier. What I saw was that there was a style to writing. For me, like, like, a, like a sort of Rubik's cube, I wanted to understand how the greatest writers uh, kind of uh, wrote, the, 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 like how the greatest images arose. Because writing is kind of like painting for the mind. Uh, So, um, yeah, I don't know guys, I just feel there's something much cooler than everything we have ever seen in our lives and it's actually behind our eyes. And when I say behind our eyes, it's as if realizing your soul is based. <laughs> on your whole moment. So the whole moment is the ultimate soul. So when a creature, when a human being realizes their mind is being their whole moment, it's a strange thing because it's like your opinions on every, every a matter suddenly are, are just go into the witness. So there's something about silent witnessing that unspeakably is, is, is the eternal uh, continuity. You know, Rumi, this poet says, be living poetry. I mean, it's like, don't just write poetry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Pues pies. <risa> We have to not just care for the nature. We don't have to just care for the body of the civilization. We have to care for the mind of the civilization. That, that in other words, that translates to how the future generations will open their eye and what kind of world will they see? What will, uh, how would we have played and move the chess mobs before it's their turn? And really, this is the grand way I can explain it, where it's like, it's a chess game between the known and the unknown, and history is how, instead of one chess master moving the chess pieces, it's like millions of beings coming into the world and leaving. Various generations arising. We are strangely, collectively as a species, sculpting uh, the vision of our collective efforts united. And let me tell you why, because you see it in many species, like you see it in animals, like in birds, they, 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 they kind of fly together. You see like wolves run together, lions have their pride, fish go to school together. <laughs> A school of fish go to school, you know? So what that means is that species that arise from nature, if we're truly animals, we have this inbuilt ability to be like those thousands of birds making wave formations in the sky. We have an ability to be like, you know, this is like something that happened that some fish, groups of fish get close together to appear as like some intimidating presence to, so the shark goes away. So groups of fish kind of like unite to kind of like scare away sharks. That, like that, that's like, those are badass fish. Yeah. <laughs> we should literally name them badass fish. <laughs> it's like, how much are they selling badass fish at the market? <laughs> You know, every moment you, 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 can see, you can choose to look at the efficient or the inefficient. If you notice, if you, choose, if you linger, your, if your attention lingers on the inefficient, a novelty reduces throughout the day. That means I can't tell you how important caring for phenomena, for, for life, for whatever that you see that is here, is how important that is to the evolution of uh, the intelligence of the species that we have to attempt to see more than how our eyes see it first. Now that endurance will inevitably mean that who's looking if we're not, if we can constantly see the new. So novelty is another way of kind of a particle never being able to subjectively be a particle. That means, uh, believe it or not, Hegel spoke about the inner internal object. On some level, you can, they, there's no internal object, it's, but there is internal, it's like a river, it's not like an object. It's, again, like uh, the Whiteheadian process, you know. So anyways, guys, um, uh, like usually people, I think, don't have questions because I'm such an incredible speaker. <laughs> but if, if, if anybody likes, you know, right now, if anybody has a question on the topic, on the, like a philosophical oriented kind of idea or, or any idea, and so, you know, it's, you know, she, you can ask, uh, sorry, guys, my attention needs to go to something right now. So the Q&A booth is open right now, guys, if anyone. <laughs> So much of life 
is being moved by nature. We are just a conscious part of nature that directs its free will subjectively and through individuality. Now, we don't want to be like this naive kind of approach where we think the world is an illusion, so we renounce everything. We don't want to be like that. We want to kind of look at the world first. We want to forget the voices of the past or any sort of voice, believe it or not. And that's why I'm saying the best way you can hear my talks is if it's a mirror of what your mind is perceiving. An advanced civilization literally means human activity needs to become more advanced. And when we look at what the concept of advanced means, it means either the self is being added dimensions or the world is being added dimensions. Our progress in technology and the upcoming cyberspace culture, you know, that's like an advancement and uh, advancement of our external technologies again. But man contemplating the nature of the mind, the nature of behavior, the nature of psychology, the nature of virtue, the nature of continuity, the na just wondering about how nature has created uh, creatures that are have named themselves and uh, e extrapolated their own value systems from how they've defined the whole thing in the first place. Do you know there is there is there is an honesty required in in. Um, the kingdoms of knowledge or the brand in all the branches of knowledge it, it, it's like the honesty to see the hollow earth and when I say the hollow earth is how the thought how there is language is a simulation of a very unique condition for a, of elements that means let me tell you what's fascinating it's like Look at your biological body right now. Isn't aren't these atoms like way more unique than the atoms of like your like a cup on the table? Like, isn't there something so fascinating about biological elemental existence? So you're like, wow, look at these complex cells that I'm being right now. <laughs> so if if we can see that we are this complex cells, now I want you to see how much more the universal sector is complex. That it's not just the uh, it, how cells have come uh, have become complex and have joined. It's how human beings, how species, how creatures have also come into a cert a certain. They have become like atoms becoming a particle, you know, bigger particle. So smaller particles leading to bigger particles, pretty much. So I'm saying that it's it's kind of like overall it's like a coin flip or pretty much the coin flip is based on if man truly believes at the end of the uh, end of life if he's really here or not. And you know study your vision doesn't that seem to be the most efficient thing that we can do as temporary creatures? Study the sight we're given, this, this, the, and even the sight we pilot. When I, I often speak about the pilots of consciousness, and something I say is that the pilots of consciousness navigate as their whole plane of existence. You can walk this earth uh, as a person, or you can walk this earth as the earth. You can walk this earth as just everything being your moment. Study the dimensions of your experience and then uh, realign all your subjectivity in accordance to what your reality is, you know. So your experiential reality is the most crucial factor of dictating uh, the momentum and even the direction of your attention. So it's like many, you, we can say, um, creatures on earth have a velocity but when you look at the velocity of an animal it's as if it really doesn't have a direction the ecosystem is the mind of the animal we are that unique creature in nature who was like all right enough of this let's wear suits and uh you know go to work through hyperloops you know <laughs> So 
So anyways, guys, um, by the way, these questions that I share, feel free, like that's why YouTube designed the comment section, you know, <laughs> feel free to share like how you see how your inner realms per perceive the outer realm, you know, that's really, that's the most valuable thing <clears throat> we can do as humans, I feel. That means our, our advancement is really based on how much we care to see the efficient. And that means we have to see, that means for the first time, self identity is less valuable than collective identity because collective identity gives a greater percentage of success uh, towards the retaliation against existence. That means, you know, like a young child. You know, you know, the father doesn't go, son, 99.9% .9 of species go extinct. You know, there's going to come a time that none of us is going to be here. That child is going to freak out, like, oh, my God. <laughs> but that, you know, and then the father's like, but good news, son, it's going to be in a billion years. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you see, it's, it's like, we control at least how we see the story meaningful to even generate characters. That means I, you can't really build a character in even a science fiction work if there's no world for that character. And so many people don't realize that the personality of a character becomes complex by where literally the attention of that character goes the moment it comes into existence in the story. You know? And the poetry of the cinematic language is how the kid, like literally if you were a director, you would kind of look at an actor and you would suddenly see how much the actor is conscious of how they are bringing the story to life. And I, I would say to actors, you know, in the film industry, any character you're given, ask yourself, how would you in some sense make this character if you could only perform it once, how would you perform this character that you, the history books will remember? So suddenly begin wondering about a simple action in a global context. Suddenly great momentum finds you. Suddenly uh, people are no longer bored because they, they are starting to hear the cries of an inefficient civilization being like, what is this? <laughs> You know, it's like, imagine an advanced avian species makes contact with Earth, like in the future, and the advanced avian species is very kind of compassionate and liberated, and they come to us, and they're like, they're coming to us with open arms, and then suddenly we see we're frowning, and they're like, why are you being so frowning? We're enlightened, advanced beings. And the, we as human beings are like, what took you so long? <laughs> you know? And then we would probably hug it out with galactic archetypes and evolve the context of all narratives towards uh, the ability to always add new dimensions. That's the spice of life, really. The personality requires space. So that means before you even understand something, you need to first look at it and what that phenomenon means in your space. You know, it's, it's like... I don't know. I mean, I'm pretty sure every person is a different kind of writer. We have different DNA, but like, and even our personalities, our ethnocentrism, our conditioning is different. But I, I've experienced that my, at some point, something became more important than the way language was making me feel satisfied with life. And it was the mystery of an experiential presence that actually is the, is the, uh, primordial presence so that means space is alive but through matter <laughs> so so <laughs> oh man <clears throat> anyways guys thanks for tuning in I feel um uh we have landed the plane. There was a smooth landing to this talk. So anyways, thanks for tuning in. Much blessings and uh, namaste.